get started. Okay. So on board one, we have the two types of FRQs. Can everyone hear me well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so there's going to be a longer one. It takes about 25 minutes to complete. It's going to be worth about two thirds of the grade and a shorter one. And I got an example that kind of mirrors each one of these right here. So for the first one, we have a scenario and a data table and we'll need to complete a few parts where we'll describe and explain biological concepts, processes, or models in applied context, identify and justify experimental design procedures, analyze data, and make and justify predictions. It's pretty similar for question two, but we don't have a data table, but they're gonna make us describe the processes, explain what's going on, predict what happens if there's a change, and support our reasoning for all of that. And so only two questions, um, 25 minutes for the first one, 15 for the second one. And now let's go really quickly to what units are on the exam. Here we got the chemistry of life, which is a lot of macromolecules, but like hydrogen bonding. Oh, oh yeah, I remember now. Okay, so three of my assignments on, on um, power school. See, they even... Okay, um, so then we have cell structure and function. So different types of cells and all the things that they need to carry out. Cellular, cellular energetics. This one's one of the hardest units. It's photosynthesis and cellular respiration. It includes glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, oxidative phosphorylation and all that stuff. Um, cell communication and cell cycle. Cell cycle would have to do with mitosis and meiosis. And the communication is how they communicate with each other. A couple of different ways. You have long distance signaling and you also have you know, uh, signaling and close contact. We have heredity, which is genetics, and then we have gene expression and regulation. These two are not gonna be on the exam, which isn't that nice because I know a lot of teachers start the AP bio with either ecology or, or one of these two, so you might have studied them, but they will not be there, so we'll skip all the questions. So remember the first question, um, going to have to do some predictions and let's go to that right away. So here's last year's FRQ and we're only going to do a couple of them because the last ones are ecology. But first, um, let's take a minute to read this. So auxins are plant hormones that coordinate several aspects of root growth and development. And dole 3 acetic acid is an auxin that is usually synthesized from the amino acid tryptophan. Uh, gene trypt encodes an enzyme that converts tryptophan to indole 3 pyruvic acid, which is then converted to IAA by an enzyme encoded by the gene YUC. So circle one arrow that represents transcription on the template pathway and identify the molecule that would be absent if enzyme YUC is non-functional. So, Anyone want to help me out? Which arrow would represent a transcription on this pathway? Anyone? So transcription is from DNA to RNA. So it would be uh, the first arrows like on the top. Exactly. Okay. Either one of these two. Um, and where would that occur? Um, trans the cell? Sorry? Transcription would occur in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep these things always in the back of your mind because um, they might ask you questions that if you know just where it is, you might be able to assume certain things and answer the question based off of educated guesses. So always think about where something might be occurring when you were dealing in the cellular level. But both of those transcription. And then Identify the molecule that would be absent if enzyme YUC is non-functional. So what would happen if YUC didn't work? 
we wouldn't have IAA. Mm -hmm. So YUC would not be able to make that. So A, just to kind of describe to the, explain the processes. Gets a little bit um, more difficult with the predictions. So predict how the deletion of one base pair in the fourth codon of the coding region of gene trip T would most likely affect the production of IAA and justify it. Anyone want to give a shot for that one? So what type of mutation is this? Deletion. And what do deletions usually result in? A point mutation? In a non-functional protein. And why would it usually be non-functional for deletion? Um, because the entire um, sequence is shifted. Exactly. So you cause a frame shift and you mess up pretty much the entire design of the protein and it goes for something different and it would pretty much guaranteed be non-functional. So absolutely. Um, but how would that pr uh, affect the production of IAA? So deletion in the coding region of trip T. Um, so would an IAA not be able to be formed because I3PA cannot be formed because enzyme TRPT is not functional? Exactly. So I don't think um, you could explain that one better. You hit exactly the entire way it could have um, occurred. So that's perfect. So we can have a deletion and a mess up in the gene that affects the entire pathway. Now, C, explain one feedback mechanism by which a cell could prevent production of too much IAA without limiting I3PA production. So let's name a couple though, but throw out some thoughts when you guys have some. So how would we prevent production of too much IAA without affecting the I3PA? Inhibiting enzyme YUC. Inhibiting enzyme YUC. How might we inhibit enzyme YUC? Um, you could have another protein, if it has like an allosteric site, then you could inhibit it that way based on concentration. Okay, well, that's a good one. What would likely be um, the allosteric regulator later in that situation? Um, maybe I3PA? Um, if I3PA wouldn't really know how to regulate it because that's getting made on its own. If you want to stop YUC when IA, IAA levels go up, you'd probably want uh, IAA as the allosteric regulator or something that might occur from IAA down further down the list might be the allosteric regulator for enzyme mm -hmm. YUC. But it would have to be this or one of its um, after uh, effects, molecules that come after. So that would be a great one. What's another way besides um, allosterically regulating the enzyme why you see? Um, could you regulate the production of the mRNA from gene why you see? And how can we do that? Where on the gene would you want to attack? The, huh? Would it be like wherever polymerase binds or something? Um, so you're trying to prevent transcription from that, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you want to prevent transcription, you want to block the ability for um, the molecule to be read and transcribed there. So you, what you want to do is attack the operon. 
So there might be a promoter region or an inhibitor region, depending on how the gene is regulated. But if it were a promoter, lack of a certain thing would cause no gene expression. And if it were an inhibitor, if we put something here, it would inhibit gene expression. And if we take it away, it would allow gene expression to go forward. So if that were the question, you'd want to attack, um, explain how you would uh, attack the operon and not allow the gene to be transcribed. But that's pretty good. Another way to do it, if anyone think of a third way to prevent IAA, um, too much production of IAA. I think those are actually the two good ones. And yeah, those are the two best ones. And you'd have a lot to say about them. So the main idea here is I'm trying to get you guys thinking about what ifs or what else might occur. Because the way this is, they're not going to have eight FRQs like they had in the past. They only have two. So they're going to have to try to combine a few different units in one question. And uh, that's kind of that's kind of way that they're going to handle that. Next, well, these guys were ecology and yeah, more ecology. So we could skip these. But were there questions on one so far? Okay, then we'll move Let's on. See. Um, actually, you said, okay. okay, the two ways in C were to attack the operon. And what was the first one? I forget. Attack the operon or allosterically regulate enzyme YUC with IAA or one of um, the molecules that come after it. Okay, thank you. Would you have to say that it's an allosteric regulation? Can you just say you're increasing IAA? Yes, the way that this question is with the exp explain, they wanted you to kind of just hit it directly one quick sentence. Um, but I had to kind of cut out two questions. So I wanted to ask you guys more while I was going along that. But absolutely, be as concise as you can. Don't give extra. But if they were asking how, then you'd have to explain exactly um, you know, the way we did it uh, then. So that was a great question. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's go on. Number two was completely ecology. So we'll skip that one. Three, so this is um, going back to the energetics, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So PDC catalyzes the conversion, conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, a, a substrate for the Krebs cycle. The rate of pyruvate conversion is greatly reduced in individuals with PDC deficiency, a rare disorder. Identify the cellular location where PDC is most active. So quick, where, where would that be most active? Um, any guesses? Let's see, it says the Krebs cycle. So yeah, the mitochondria. Yep, the mitochondria. Right, specifically right on the mitochondrial matrix, but they'll give you points for either of them. And so how does PDC deficiency affect the amount of NADH produced by glycolysis and the amount of NADH produced by Krebs cycle in the cell? I provide reasoning based on the position of the PDC catalyzed reaction and the sequence of the cellular respiration pathway. Okay. How does PDC deficiency affect glycolysis? Where does glycolysis occur? Before the citric acid cycle. Before, but where in the cell? Oh, um, in the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm. And how do you get into the mitochondria? Um, 
Well, I was just, uh, how many barriers does the mitochondria have anyways? Two. It would actually be a triple membrane barrier, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Um, the plasma membrane, double layer. And so in order to get in the mitochondria, um, you have to be very specific. You have to be, you know, invited into the mitochondria uh, pretty much. And since glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm, um, PDC deficiency, which uh, basically affects molecules on the mitochondrial matrix, doesn't affect glycolysis at all. So glycolysis would still go forward. You'd still make exactly the same amount of NADH from glycolysis. But what would happen in the Krebs cycle? Um, would the amount of NADH produced decrease because now you don't have um, the substrate that's used in the Krebs cycle? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then where, so provide reasoning to support your claims based on the position of the PDC catalyzed reaction. So where would that be? Um, so does that reaction occur in between glycolysis and Krebs cycle, which is why it wouldn't affect glycolysis, but it would affect the Krebs cycle? Exactly. It's pretty much the initiator for the Krebs cycle and, and between them. So 100%. Does it mean the physical position or like the um, weights in the sequence? It kind of acts kind of both. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're both important here. Okay, and then let's go for C. So num the first one was supposed to be quite a bit longer. Last year's FRQs three through eight were the shorter ones. So you should be a little quicker with these guys. Um, but let's go for C. PDC deficiency is caused by mutations in the PDHA1 gene, which is located on the X chromosome. A male with PDC deficiency and a homozygous female with no family history of PDC deficiency have a male offspring. Calculate the probability that the male offspring will have PDC deficiency. Okay, so um, what are we dealing with here? So we got into genetics, but specifically what type of problem? Sex linked. Sex linked chromosomes. And anytime you're dealing with um, genetics, and if you can, make a punnett square, I say you should like 100%. So let's see, what is the male? Let's read carefully. So the male has the deficiency. So the X chromosome is carrying the gene for it and the Y chromosome is not. Mm -hmm. So he has an X and a Y, and if he's carrying it, you give him the little letter. So we could say, well, that can't see capital for that guy. So we'll give him a small one. And what about the female? She's homeless, I guess. So, and she does not have it. So none of the chromosomes are carrying it. Now let me finish this up. What is the probability that the male offspring would have the, the deficiency? Uh, zero. Zero. Um, perfect. So the sex linked one, it's as long as you carefully write your Punnett square, remembering lowercase for a recessive, um, Ys for the second part of the males. Those won't be so bad, but when we do it carefully, we see zero. What's the probability that a female offspring will have the deficiency? Also zero. Also zero. And what's the probability that a female offspring will be a carrier? 100. 100. 100. Perfect. So just 
don't be shy. Draw the opponent square. Uh, I've made mistakes on easy genetic problems before because I was too lazy to draw them. So just do everything as thorough as possible if it's going to help you answer the question. Um, so I um, think for this okay. question? Oops, yes. Um, if they ask you to explain your response, would the planet square be enough? Or do you have to like explain this planet square? Um, they would usually ask for a planet square instead of an explanation. Okay. But if they asked you to explain it, I would use the words and maybe a planet square in addition to it, but the words for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, another good one. So they like to put a lot of um, bold. So they're kind of making sure you attack the question. And so really focus on those. And let's go to this one. So number four was one of the uh, ones that is a type that is going to be similar to question two on your exam. So here we're not really dealing with data, but we're just going to have a biological process and we're going to mess with it, something big, and we're going to explain what's going to happen because of it. So Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that can activate an action potential in a postsynaptic neuron. A researcher is investigating the effects of a particular neurotoxin that causes the amount of acetylcholine released from presynaptic neurons to increase. Um, describe the immediate effect of the neurotoxin on the number of action potentials in a postsynaptic neuron. Predict whether the maximum membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron will increase, decrease, or stay the same. So what would the immediate effect of the neurotoxin be on the number of action potentials in the postsynaptic neuron? So go back, read it carefully. So neurotoxin causes acetylcholine released to increase. And we know acetylcholine activates action potentials. So here they kind of explained, they gave us the answer and we didn't really need to remember that acetylcholine does that from our material, but we could kind of just say the immediate effect would be an increase in the number of action potentials. So that's point one. Pretty easy. We don't need to explain why I didn't say justify or anything like that. So we don't need to spend any time writing extra stuff there. But then here, a little tricky one. Predict whether the maximum membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron will increase, decrease, or stay the same. So Here's the membrane potential graph. That maximum is near 30 millivolts. The threshold for the action potential is right here. And it asks, predict if that potential will increase, decrease, or stay the same, that maximum. Now, what are your guys' thoughts on this one? Let's see, if the immediate effect is it's going to increase the action potential, and I'm guessing the, um, the threshold has to increase, or the maximum has to increase. Um, yeah, this one's probably a really tricky one, because what happens is when these guys get into the synapse is they just start triggering these guys um, to fire. Eventually, you release so much acetylcholine that it's flooded and it's doing everything that it can. And the only thing that really affects the membrane potential is when it does fire the action potential, the, the influx of sodium and potassium. So that exchange of sodium and potassium into and out of the neuron is what changes that. But it, the action potential would just cause that. More action potentials just cause more of those. But more of those don't affect the um balance between sodium and potassium in any given one it would always regulate itself and once it gets to 30 it kind of 
knows, all right, reset and come back down. So our nerve cells and neurons automatically kind of have that maximum built in and know come back down after that point. Um, and that's actually when the gates open again and it will say, all right, let's go back. So the potassium gates open and add that potential. So it would just happen faster, but the potentials wouldn't change. Um, the electrical difference wouldn't really uh, have an effect there. So very confusing one. And it, you would really needed to know about that potassium and sodium um, influx in there. So go ahead and ask questions on that one. I know that's a tough one. Well, go ahead and read it one more time. Okay, so in this situation, what would make the maximum membrane potential go up or down? The only thing that would do that is if you messed with the neurons signaling, um, which would not turn off the, or it wouldn't basically, if you messed with the ability for the channels to close, that's what would happen. If you mess with the ability for the sodium or potassium to reset or to balance or to go where they need to go, and you're only letting one thing out, you could create a huge potential that would even be bigger than this. Okay. Yeah, that was actually a really good question. So is that only if the neurotransmitters don't get released? Uh, sorry? So is that if the neurotransmitters don't get released? No, um, the neurotransmitters would be getting released, firing it, but there would be a problem with the nerve cells um, gate. So even if it had, it felt the action potential, it would fire, but it wouldn't be able to stop the fire, basically. So you would still need the action potential to start it, but if the gates were messed up, then it would not be able to um, get the balance back. So does that answer that question? Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. So definitely one of the tough ones. Um, if you get the nerve cell, I recommend pulling up a diagram of the action uh, potential and it will, you know, in your textbooks, if you have them, it'll show you exactly what's coming in and out of the cell. You have exactly the um, thresholds and it would tell you about 30 millivolts is when it comes back down. So as long as you have your page open to the action potential one, that would be something I would spend a few minutes on. Uh, so I know it's open notes and you don't want to spend too much time on your notes, but if you have diagrams, that's going to really help. So you, you definitely want to have like a meiosis chart available. Mitosis one, um, one of these, the Krebs cycle, glycolysis, photosynthesis. So anything that you can put into a picture instead of having a bunch of notes for would be 10 times better for this, um, for this exam. So kind of if, if you have textbooks, put a sticky on every one of those big diagrams that you studied for over and over again throughout the course of the year. So you don't have to focus on memorizing what's going on, but you could at least apply it. Uh, so but with open notes, that question does get a little bit easier. Without it, that one is, I'm say most people are gonna miss that one for sure. Uh, but let's go for B. So the researcher proposes two models, A and B for using ACHE, an enzyme that degrades acetylcholine to prevent the effect of, neuro, of the neurotoxin. In model A, ACHE is added to the synapse. In model B, ACHE is added to the cytoplasm of the postsynaptic cell. Predict the effectiveness of each proposed model and provide reasoning. So if we put acetylcholinesterase, which degrades acetylcholine in the synapse, how effective do you think that might be in preventing that effect of the neurotoxin? Not effective because by then the neurotransmitter has already been released. The neurotransmitter has been released, but what does a neurotransmitter have to do 
in order to get its message across. Connect to the receptors on the other side. Actually, so it has to actually get there. So if they have to fight a battle before they get there, not as many reach the receptors on the other side, that would actually cause, um, you know, that would exactly prevent the effect of the neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. So the neurotoxin adds more acetylcholine. These guys attack it and prevent the acetylcholine from affecting it even more. What would happen if we add ACHE to the cytoplasm of the postsynaptic cell? So where's the cytoplasm of the postsynaptic cell? That oh, so would go ahead. Oh, no, you can go. Over that. that would literally be anywhere inside of it. Yeah, so that wouldn't be effective because the signal's already been sent. The signal's already been sent. The action potential already goes down. And once you send it, there's no going back from them. So perfect. Um, questions on B or A if uh, B was straightforward. All right, yeah, let's go ahead. Here, a cladogram that's definitely evolution. Okay. Here, uh, the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a single celled organism. Amino acid synthesis in yeast cells occurs through metabolic pathways, and enzymes in the synthesis pathways are encoded by different genes. The synthesis of a particular amino acid can be prevented by mutation of a gene encoding an enzyme in the required pathway. A researcher conducted an experiment to determine, to determine the ability of yeast to grow on media that differ in amino acid content. Yeast can grow as both haploid and diploid cells. The researcher tested two different haploid yeast strains, each of which has a single recessive mutation and a haploid wild strain. So single recessive mutation for those two and a wild type strain. Wild type usually refers to what? The dominant one. The dominant one, the non-mutant one, absolutely. So identify oh, the role of treatment one in the experiment. So let's see. Data show the growth. Plus sign indicates that they grow. A minus indicate that they do not grow. Treatment one, all amino acids present. No amino acids present for two. All except methionine for three. All except leucine for four. So what's the role of treatment one in the experiment? The control. Act as a control. Can you elaborate that on just a little bit more? Why do we need a control? Um, to see if the factor that they're manipulating is the only thing that affects it. Perfect. That's full points there. Um, let's see. So provide reasoning to explain how meat and one can grow on treatment one medium but cannot grow on treatment three medium. So take a minute, let me know what you guys think. Okay, so treatment one has all amino acids, but treatment three is missing methionine, so it must be because of that. Okay, and exactly why, what because of it is causing it not to be able to grow? Um, the absence of methionine. The absence of methionine. Okay. Um, perfect. So, exactly. Since, so mutant one cannot synthesize methionine, it must get it from its environment. That's a great explanation. Exactly. Um, C. Yeast mate by fusing two haploid cells to make a diploid. 
In the second experiment, the researcher mates the mutant one and mutant two haploid strains to produce diploid cells. Using the table provided, predict whether the diploid cells will grow on each of the four media. Use a plus sign to indicate growth and a minus to indicate no growth. Okay, so if we had another one right here, and this is the diploid guy, what do you think would happen in treatment one? Would the diploid be able to grow? Yes, because um, both mutant one and mutant two are able to grow. Mm -hmm. So take a minute, let me know what else you guys think. Where should I put pluses or minuses? Okay, so for the second one, treatment two, they should not be able to grow because uh, mutant one and two don't grow. Mutant one and mutant two don't grow. In treatment two. In treatment two. Okay. But would the diploid be able to? Let's think about that. So neither of those grow, but what are they missing? Oh, they're missing amino acids? Not the amino they're acids. They're missing the ability to synthesize them. Okay. Which amino acid is me and one missing the ability to make? Methionine. And um, what about uh, mutant two? Leucine. Exactly. So one of them is missing the ability to create methionine, and that ruins all of its functions, and it can't grow. And the other one is missing the ability to create leucine. But when you put mutant one, which lacks the ability to create methionine, mutant two can create the methionine that it lacks. And okay. for leucine, um, though mutant two couldn't grow without it, mutant one could provide the DNA that can code for the amino acid leucine. So the two things that are being missed there, they have each other's backs for it. So they can cover for each other and make the one thing that the other cannot. And therefore the diploid is able to make all amino acids. So that one was probably the more difficult of them all, but uh, questions with that explanation. Okay, what about three? It would be able to. It would be? Yes. Yes, mutant two, um, well, if you don't have methionine, mutant two will cover for it. Mutant one's lack of, you know, ability to produce it. Mm -hmm. And then four? Um, it would also be able to for the same reason. Exactly. So treatment two was probably the one that's going to get like 80% of the students it just seems like there should be no way that they could be able to make it at first glance. But when you realize they're only missing one thing and only missing one thing that each other can provide, it'd be perfect. As long as they are missing different things. If they're missing the same thing, they have no, no ability to do anything there. But any other questions with that problem? Okay. Oh, there's that table. Here, a researcher is studying patterns of gene expression in mice. The researcher collected samples from six different tissues in a healthy mouse and measured the amount of mRNA from six genes. The data are shown in figure one. Based on the data provided, identify the gene that is most likely to encode a protein that is an essential component of glycolysis. Provide reasoning to support your identification. So I know the table is a little weird. Go ahead, take a minute. Let me know when you guys are familiar with it.
Um, could I try answering? Go ahead. Uh, would it be gene G because it's present in all cells and like cellular respiration happens in all cells? Perfect. That. And you provided your reasoning there too. So since cellular respiration or um, beginning of it, glycolysis would occur in, in all cells? Absolutely. Okay. And the researcher observed that tissues with a high level of gene H mRNA do not always have gene H protein. Provide reasoning to explain how tissues with high gene H mRNA levels can have no gene H protein. So what's going on here? How can you have a gene um, and then have a bunch of mRNA transcribed for that gene, but no protein come from that gene, or at least not that protein that it was designed to create? Um, maybe are there no amino acids present um, that allow the construction of the protein? That would be quite a rare scenario where we didn't even have any amino acids to use. So I wouldn't say that's very likely, but if that were the case, it absolutely would not be able to make that work. Um, so instead of not having them, it would have to be a disruption or you probably want to explain um, their, the tRNA can't grab it. There's something wrong with the tRNA in their ability to create and assemble the amino acids or something like that. So yeah, I'd say not that there are no amino acids, but that something is broken along the line that doesn't allow them to assemble properly. So that would be probably one way couple other ways. Um, could you say something like alternative splicing or is that before it becomes mRNA? Absolutely. You can have that splicing. So that's basically while it's being exported, uh, taken out of the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And um, you create a different, instead of, you know, gene H making gene H protein, you could reassemble it and make a completely different protein. So absolutely, those would work. Uh, other post-transcriptional modifications might work too, but that's that was an excellent one. And probably the only other one is the mRNA never left the nucleus. You just have a bunch of mRNA floating around and it's not, uh, there's a problem with its ability to exit the nucleus, which would not allow it to ever get transcribed at all. So, because uh, the trans, uh, well, sorry, translated into the protein because the translation occurs where and by what? You said uh, where a translation occurs? Yes. And that's what, in the ribosomes, right? That's the ribosomes do it, but where do they do that? Hmm. The cytoplasm? In the cytoplasm, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, well, how does transcription and translation this is kind of a different question completely but how does transcription and translation different in prokaryotes and eukaryotes um in prokaryotes they happen simultaneously and in eukaryotes they're separate steps. perfect so knowing that that occurs might help you uh, justify something so keep all those uh, you know um anything you know about it keep, let it uh come to your mind have good you know, pages open for it, but that was a great, ex uh, great qu uh, answer right there. So, post transcriptional, not exported from the nucleus. I think that's good. So, definitely covers those. So, let's go on to, um, yeah, the last one. So, here. Changes in morning glory petal cells during flower opening. So the petal color of the Mexican morning glory changes from red to blue and the petal cells swell during flower opening. 
The pigment heavenly blue anthocyanin is found in the vacuole of petal cells. Petal color is determined by the pH of the vacuole. A model of a morning glory petal cell before and after opening is shown in table one. Identify the cellular component in the model that is responsible for the increase in the pH of the vacuole during flower opening and describe the component's role in changing the pH. Okay, go ahead, take a minute, and let me know if anyone has an idea. Okay, so to me, it looks like the K channel is responsible because it's letting in um, all the Ks come in. Exactly, that K plus channel protein was still doing all the, the dirty work. Perfect. Um, yeah, what is it doing specifically? Um, it's letting in the Ks. Wait, sorry. Oh. Wait, let's see. Identify the opponent component responsible for the increase in the vacuole. So let's take a closer look actually. Increase in the vacuole. So what's going on in the vacuole? So that K plus channel looks like it might have been the K, but when we take a closer look, we actually see so a little bit more careful reading would tell us this is the transport protein responsible for changing the pH of the vacuole. And then how would it do so? Okay, so, oh, well, you wanna go, you can go ahead. Um, could I ask you a question about that? Uh -huh. Um, since it says which one is responsible for increasing the pH of the vacuole, would you only be able to say the proton pump, or could you also say the? Or can we also say sorry? Um, or would you also be able to say the transport protein for K plus and H plus? Because um, would you only look at the one that's bringing in hydrogen ions? Or if you bring in, uh, that's a great question. Wonderful question. Let's go ahead and read the question a little bit more carefully. Identify the cellular component in the model that is responsible for the increase in pH. If you're putting extra H's inside, what's going on? Um, the pH would increase. What is the pH? Oh, no. Yes, it decreases. Okay. Exactly. The pH yeah. would increase since you'd have a higher H concentration. So that... Um, well, it could have been the proton pump if it was decrease. Mm -hmm. The question increase, this guy. It doesn't matter that K is going in because K doesn't affect anything to do with the pH. But since it swaps out an H, it would increase the pH every time it does so. So that one actually was quite tricky. It needed really careful reading because there's something different going on in the vacuole than the rest of the cell. And exactly... You know, H is moving all over the place, but which one causes the increase? So perfect. So it would definitely have to be this transport protein. And because it takes H plus out of the vacuole, therefore increasing the pH. So kind of a little small chain there, but any questions on A? Then B, a researcher claims that the activation of the K plus H plus transport protein causes the vacuole to swell with water. Provide reasoning to support the researcher's claims. Why might this protein causes vacuole to swell? Um. Could you say it's because it's in a hypotonic solution? So since there's like a higher concentration of K plus inside, it takes in water. Exactly. So now the vacuole becomes hypotonic to the surroundings and would have to take in water. Perfect. So hy yeah, actually, um, yeah. 
So the concentration would increase, so water would have to come in in order to decrease that concentration and try to separate, uh, balance it back out. So, excellent. Questions on that one? Okay, got a couple more. So for this one, Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disorder caused by the abnormal gene for hemoglobin S. A single substitution occurs in which glutamic acid is substituted for valine in the sixth position of the hemoglobin molecule. This change reduces hemoglobin's ability to carry oxygen. Describe the process by which mutation occurs in base substitution. So how does the mutation occur in a base substitution, and they say the process. So what happens first? Okay, so it's a substitution, so two bases are swapped out with each other? Two bases swapped out. Perfect. Second, what happens? The amino acids that it was supposed to make before are changed because of the different, um, like, the order. Um, what type of mutation is this again? Uh, base substitution. This is a substitution. So it doesn't miss the order. It messes with what? Um, like a specific amino acids? Just a specific amino acid. So oftentimes a single, single substitution doesn't destroy a protein's ability to do something, but it might hinder its ability to perform efficiently, especially in this case. So you just changed one of them and then you changed one amino acid in that protein and anything else? No. no that's about it. Um, yeah. Oh, and then how does it Reduce the, no, I didn't really ask it. It said, it said describe the process of mutation. So that answers it fully. And B, biologists used gel electrophoresis to initially identify the mutant gene. Explain how gel electrophoresis could be applied to the identification of the gene mutation and discuss the use of restriction enzymes. So what does gel electrophoresis do? Basically something that separates molecules based off of electricity, charge, size, molecular weight, a couple of different things. So it allows us to separate molecules from each other and know exactly what we have. Now, um, if we want to identify a mutant gene, then we can put basically a bunch of that gene into um, an electrophoresis. Well, first we actually have to use restriction enzymes to cut them and see if there's any mutations that we can attack and split up based off of a certain uh, coding sequence. And then if a mutant, so since we know a mutant would have a different um, amino acid, we could cut based off of that amino acid and we could basically separate the molecules by size. And what we would see with a gel electrophoresis chart is we might see um, if we put a couple different things on that chart, we might see something really big not move very far. And if it only got broken up into one piece, you'd only see one piece of it. But then if you had attacked a mutation using a restriction enzyme, you'd be able to break it into two or more pieces, which are be smaller and they would travel farther. So the farther you travel, the smaller you are. And the more things that show up, the first one is just the test, like kind of where you put it. So then here is only one molecule. Here would be two molecules. All right, so then we could say this thing got cut there. So that means this has that 
mutation or it had that different base pair that we could have used the restriction enzyme to cut. So this one was quite a difficult question, but I wanted to kind of just bring up how electrophoresis, you know, all that stuff, because it's something that you don't talk about too much, but they like to ask these a lot. So if it were to come up, anyone have questions on how to read this or how you can identify something based off of the differences in that? Any questions? Let's see. So if you're trying to identify like a certain, what is it, like a certain gene with that, you would just, you said you put more of it like into the solution so it would show up more? No, what you have to do is you actually just have, um, you have multiple copies of that gene. And then you uh, stick a restriction enzyme with them knowing and an enzyme that cuts a specific mutation that you're prepared to see. So if you know you expect something to see if a mutation is there, you put a specific enzyme. So if the DNA was just nice and long, but we have a restriction enzyme that cuts a certain part of it, then we will see instead of one nice strand of DNA, we, we see two or more strands of DNA. So what's going on there is just a restriction enzyme used to cut um, a DNA sequence and to make it into multiple fragments. And if the restriction enzyme was able to cut in the first place, that identifies the mutation. So, okay. yeah, that, I think, yeah, does that answer everyone's questions on that one? Yeah, so you know the enzyme can attack something. So if it were able to attack, you knew that something was there. Okay. C um, is a Punnett square, a simple Mendelian one. So we could skip that. That's even easier than the sex-linked ones. And let's quickly go here for the last question. So cell size is limited by surface area to volume ratio of the cell membrane. Why is cell size limited by that ratio? Think of everything that you might be able to um, you know, use to answer this question. What does um, cell do? Go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, um, since a cell needs to take in stuff from its environment, um, if it has too large a volume and too small a surface area, then it won't be able to take enough to like survive, I guess. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. And then Last one, How, describe uh, processes by which small polar and small nonpolar molecules can cross cell membranes according to their gradients and give an example of each type of molecule. So small nonpolar, how can they get through? Like carbon dioxide. They can diffuse across the membrane. Freely, perfectly. Why can they diffuse so easily? Um, because of the hydrophobic tails on the interior. Exactly. They're also nonpolar. Perfect. What about the hydrophobic, um, sorry, what about the polar molecules? Um, I think, um, oh, go ahead. No, no, you go, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's due to the small polar molecules, or sorry, the, the um, hydrophilic heads, and also the fact that they're small molecules so they can pass easily. So, but how, so they get to the, the, the polar ones get to the heads, the hydrophilic heads, but what happens when they get to the heads? They get stuck there. They can't really transfer in between because that hydrophobic tails, the hydrophobic tails are so long. So they can. Oh, the, um, mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, the channel protein. So the, the polar molecules need channel proteins regardless. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then we already have an example carbon dioxide for the nonpolar. What about polar?
It was the most polar molecule you guys could think of. Well, water would be, I guess, um, one thing that would have to go through that too. So I think that gets to the end of our um, questions here. Um, Wait, can you, yeah, can you repeat A, part A? Can you repeat what was said? Yes. So the cell, um, the surface area to volume ratio, uh, it's limited by that ratio because um, as you get bigger, your volume increases pretty dramatically compared to your surface area. And your surface area is how you take in things. And if your volume is so big, you won't, and your surface area is not that big, you're not gonna be able to take in or get rid of things as fast as you need to, to help the, uh, everything grow. So it's basically because um, it can't intake things as fast, even though it would need more to grow if the volume was growing, if the volume got bigger. So it has to do um, with basically the surface area because of the influx of these mo molecules that they're talking about. Sm uh, smaller surface area to volume ratio means these molecules have a harder time going in and out. And even if they do come in and out, it changes the concentration just slightly. So does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you guys for, you know, joining. Um, did you guys have any last general questions about the exam? Remember the types of questions. Um, I believe they sent you guys these FRQs, but remember one and four are very um, close to what the actual ones are. Even though for one, I know we had a shorter question, but I did try to elaborate on that just in case they wanted to add a little bit more there. But thanks for, for, for you guys uh, sticking with me. And you guys had a lot of great questions and great answers. And um, yeah, if there's nothing else, I wish you guys the best of luck on, on your guys' test. Thank you for the help. Thank you. Have a good one, Thank you. Have a good one you guys. You too. Oh, well.